Welcome back to the Missing Maura Murray podcast. How are you tonight, Lance? I'm doing well. How are you? Doing great. This is part one of a two-part special report we're doing on the disappearance of Brianna Maitland. Her case is a sad one, and we've decided to talk about it because it will often come up while looking into Maura's case. We've gotten many questions about it, and some people even think the two cases are connected. We spoke to Mark Harper of MJA in episode 32, and that's what he believes. So you can check that out if you haven't already. Yeah, and it's a natural transition to make between the two cases. Looking, if you're investigating the two cases, it's a natural transition to look at Mora, to look at Brianna, to look at Mora, you know, to go back and forth with them, see the differences, see the similarities. There are definitely some similarities between the cases, and we will talk to our guest about those tonight. Our guest for this episode is a Canadian journalist named Tarek, and he's been working on the Brianna Maitland case for about two years. So in regards to Brianna Maitland's case, she went missing on March 19th in 2004. That's about a month a little bit more than a month after Mora went missing. Brianna went missing in Montgomery, Vermont. That's about an hour and 45, two hours away from where Mora's car was found. Brianna was age 17, uh, and she the, the, the car was found in a, in, off the side of the road. So it, it is similar in, the, in that respect. There are those, like we said, who believe that the two are connected. And there are those who believe that they're not connected, but there's... More to that darkness, there's like another darkness that is up in that area that kind of lives beneath the surface of of that like northeast region. We get into that quite a bit with our guest for this episode. Thank you very much for listening. And go to blueapron.com slash missing to get your first three meals free with free shipping. Can you tell us a little bit about you and your background? I'm in my mid-20s. I uh, live in Canada. I've been living here for most of my life. And uh, I'm an investigator journalism. I've done, uh, I've covered some, a lot of things like, uh, you know, politics, sports, uh, crime stories. I have a BA in, uh, in journalism. I speak four languages. I'm a big sports fan. Um, what is it about the Maura Murray case that uh, gets you so interested? Well, I actually started working on the Brianna Maitland case uh, in July 2015. And obviously, when I started working, you know, more Murray's name came up because it happened like six weeks later and 80 miles apart. So obviously, I was really interested in finding out uh, what happened with uh, more Murray as well. But then I saw that there was a blog on it. I saw that you guys were starting your podcast. I think you were in episode three or something. So I thought that, you know, since there's so many flurry of activity going around the Moore Murray case, I would look into the Brianna Maitland case because I felt like this was a case that was really like under the radar. There wasn't really a lot of activity. There wasn't really a lot of people that were commenting or interested in that case, at least from my initial perspective. Do you find the two cases to be similar? Well, I do find that they're similar, but, you know, that's about it. There's a few things, uh, you know, like the cars being found emptied and locked and the two girls just going missing uh, out of nowhere. And, you know, they're never being solved. Both cases not being solved and both cases happening at the same time of the year at the same year. So there are some similarities, but it's when you go deeper into it that you realize that the chances that they are related are actually quite small. You said you started uh, looking into Brianna Maitland in 2015. Yeah. Okay, so you've been doing it for about two years. Right, yeah. Plenty of time to get a lot of information for a case. So if you don't mind explaining the situation uh, surrounding Brianna's disappearance before we get a little deeper into it. She was a 17-year-old. She had just turned 17 on October 8, 2003. She was born in uh, 1986. And so she was just you know, the typical teenage girl that was going to high school, she had friends and she was getting a little more independent, wanting to be uh, wanting to be social, wanting to be with friends, uh, didn't really want to be always in living with her parents on their remote farm. And uh, yeah, that's how she basically, I believe that maybe around that time, maybe I would say in the span of six to months to a year before she went missing is when her area became uh, sort of infested with these people. She, you know, started partying like most teenagers do, it's no big deal. And she was going to high school at the, also at the same time. Uh, she was going to, uh, she went to a high school uh, called uh, the Mississauga Valley Union High School, which is in Swanton and Highgate Springs. 
And then uh, she ended up moving to a high school in uh, Innisburg Falls uh, at the end of her sophomore year. And then uh, that's when things started to move around a lot. There was a lot of movement basically before she went missing. She started working uh, two jobs, uh, or actually she started one job. She was supposed to start her second job uh, uh, actually a few days after she went missing. She got a job as a dishwasher at the Black Lantern Inn in uh, Montgomery in Vermont. Uh, and she was working there uh, full time because she had just gotten her G GHD and she wanted to start college part time and work because she had to, you know, she was alone. She, she was living, you know, from one place to another, like living with a few friends, living with, you know, a couple of boyfriends and things like that. And she wanted to really be independent, but she also needed the money. So she had, she was kind of like juggling between two jobs and wanting to uh, make something out of her life. A lot of things changed in the few weeks before she went missing. You know, she was assaulted at a party. And uh, she was also, as time went on, I, I this is pure speculation, but I believe that she was trying to get her life back on track and that as she was trying to get her life back on track, she was moving away from that, that group of people uh, that ultimately were involved in her disappearance. But I think that uh, what happened basically is that on the night of March 19, 2004, uh, she finished her shift as a dishwasher uh, at the Black Lantern Inn around 11, 12, 11, 30. And she took her car, which was a Oldsmobile uh, 1988 uh, sedan royal. So it's a really, it's kind of a, in the 80s was a luxury car. And she took off, you know, the next day, they found her car where they found it. They found it, and there was no trace of her. Anyone who listens to this podcast, they're fans of true crime. They're looking into the Moore Murray case. Uh, they inevitably you get Brianna Maitland coming up in any search, uh, and they've seen the picture of the car backed into the barn. How did that car get reported? Well, actually, what happened is that on the morning of March 20th, so that would be the next day, uh, around 10, 11 o'clock, there was a group of uh, skiers that were coming from uh, JP Ski, Ski Resort, which is about, uh, I would say, about 20 miles east of where her car was found. And they were coming back on the, on the road where her car was found, and they saw the car, and they thought it was so strange that they stopped by and they took pictures. So 99% of the pictures that were reported to the police, that were the media, that were used in, you know, the disappeared show, those are actually not police pictures. They're pictures from that group of skiers that saw the car there and they thought, well, that's strange. So, you know, they snapped about five or six pictures. So those are the main pictures that were seen. So based on the chronology of events, I would say that the first people in daylight that saw her car would be those ski travelers but at the same time, around between 1 o'clock and 4 o'clock in the morning uh, of uh, early morning, 4 a.m., March 20th, uh, you know, there were a couple of people that were passing by that road and they saw her car or her ex-boyfriend, James, uh, was coming back from a night of partying in Montreal and he crossed the border and he passed by her car around 4 o'clock and he saw it, but he didn't see, you know, anyone around it. And uh, there were also a few people that reported seeing the car around uh, midnight, 1 o'clock in the morning that were passing by and they saw, uh, one person said that they saw, uh, cause I, I, I don't speak English <laughs> that often, so I just... Doing better than I do. <laughs> there was a blinking light. Um, Ads or lights? Uh, yeah, and uh, the other driver reported seeing the uh, the headlights were open, uh, but they did. They, were, they said that they didn't, didn't see anyone around it, and that was at 4 o'clock in the morning. You know, her boyfriend, uh, I can tell you that he, he was questioned and... You know, he, he was cleared in a way as having any direct involvement, but uh, he did report seeing the car. And uh, basically that was during the night. And then the next day, uh, those were the three people that I told you about that saw the car. And then I'm assuming that one of them called police or maybe a neighbor. I think a neighbor, I think it was said in, in the newspapers that a neighbor called police because there's a few ha houses there. And then there was a, a state trooper that came by the house around 1 p.m. on that day. And uh, he then saw the car. So that was the first time the police saw the car. Was this a very popular road? It's hard to say because I wasn't there in 2004. When I went there on the road, uh, it, was a, it was a Saturday afternoon. And there were cars got, coming and going every minute. 
my guess is that in 2004, um, it wasn't that, you know, crowded, like during the day, it wasn't, there wasn't that many people going through that road, but it's a pretty important road because it's the only, or at least it's the main road for anyone that's going from uh, the west side of uh, Franklin County to eastbound to Montgomery and to Jay Ski uh, Peak Resort. It was probably an important road then, and it's probably, it still is an important road today, definitely, yeah. How big is the town that this happened in? Well, Montgomery is about 1,200 people. Uh, back then in 2004, it was about 900 people. And essentially what's really important to understand is that all the towns in that area are less than 2,000 people. We're talking maybe 900 to 2,000 people. You know, all the towns, uh, you know, Berkshire, uh, Montgomery, uh, Richford, all those towns, it's about 1,000 to 2,000 people. So obviously, you know, everyone knows everyone and it's really not a big place it's it's a it's a rural area i mean it's just uh, you know all the families know each other and the neighbors so whenever someone new comes in town uh you know things get told and you know you don't go in there uh and leave without people seeing you or wondering who you are at least that's the feeling i got when i was there twice especially kind of like uh what's bordering on a cold case because after a certain period of time not a lot of new information starts coming out so you try to you you tend to tread the same ground my question is what is what do you typically say to people who are so focused on connecting the two cases and saying that there's some uh link between them that there's a serial killer and these the these cases are are connected what what what's your response to them well, the first thing I would say is that if you look at the way Moore Murray went missing, like the specific timeline and when it happened happened during the day, and you look at Brianna when she went missing when it happened, there's some differences uh, in the sense that the probability of a serial killer just happening to be upon a dark road uh, almost at midnight when it's freezing outside and just waiting for someone to be there seems a little far-fetched to me. And that that's something I would say to people like, if you want to live in that world where you think this could happen, that's fine. And I'm not going to be like judgmental or say, oh, how dare you not agree with me? No, you know, people are entitled to their opinions and that's fine. What I would say is look at the two cases, look at the facts of the case and, you know, take a look at, you know, more Murray's life before she went missing and Brianna Maitland's life before she went missing. And you'll notice that the probability that the two cases are related is fairly far-fetched in my opinion uh, and you know there's obviously obviously some details that we can get into later but it's you know you have to look at the facts of the case the events prior to them going missing and i think then you realize that they're probably not related what's the smoking gun <laughs> the smoking gun is essentially there's a lot of things uh i would say the smoking gun is the general situation in vermont at that time and it's still somewhat the case today uh, what we've had at the time that Brianna went missing, there was really a big uh, crack epidemic. There were a lot of drug dealers that were coming from, from Massachusetts, from New York, from other bordering neighboring states that were coming in these small rural towns in Vermont uh, specifically to sell drugs. And since there were teenagers in that area that were, you know, like Brianna or her age or younger or older, and they didn't have a whole lot to do there. And having been there it's true that unless you have a car and unless you know a lot of people, you're mostly going to go out in these parties and, you know, there's going to be lots of things that are going to be offered to you there. But my general consensus would be uh, there's a certain atmosphere in Vermont. There are certain things that happened before Brianna went missing. That leads me to believe it's very specific. It's, it's much more specific than more. More specific as far as motive? Yes, more specific as far as motive, but more specific as far as the general context at the time in that area. Because, you know, I do agree that Vermont and New Hampshire, like the two areas where these girls went missing, they're fairly close to one another. But at the same time, it's, I, I don't know, New, I've never been to New Hampshire, but I do know that in Vermont at the time, the situation was really specific to that area. I'm 100% positive that Brianna's disappearance was drug related. Now, when you say that, obviously you have to go and, and show why you're saying that, show proof of that. What I can tell you guys is that um, the general consensus around the area, the general consensus with the people I talk to, uh, even the police, 
is that it was drug related, but not in the sense that it's not necessarily in the sense that it's been presented, like that she had a drug debt or that uh, you know she she stole something or whatever. It, it, it was drug related in the sense that she was made go missing. I'm not even sure we can say that, but she was uh, the people who made her go missing were people that were involved in the drug business in various ways. Uh, they were not. Uh, just a random uh, killer that, you know, just kills for, for the thrill of it. They were really people that were involved in that in much deeper ways than, uh, than Brianna, because I don't think she was involved at all in drugs. And they were involved in a way where uh, I don't even think that Brianna in her, in her situation knew how much uh, they were involved in that. So you're saying that she possibly knew them? Are, are you speaking of uh, people, like, specifically? Yes, Yes, there are some people that have been named. Uh, there's also a lot of people that have not been named and that cannot be named because it would compromise the investigation. But what I can tell you is that I'm positive that at least six to ten people uh, should be charged in various ways with her disappearance slash murder because, you know, we can't prove anything without, or at least it's hard to prove something without a body, without physical evidence. But what I would say is that uh, yes, she knew the people that were uh, involved that made her go missing. I don't know if she knew them all perfectly well, but she knew most of them. Like, it, it wasn't random. It wasn't a random killer. So it's kind of interesting that there has been this secret of what happened to Brianna that, that's lasted these 12-plus uh, years. I think the, uh, the family private investigator described it best That's saying there's a conspiracy of silence. And I believe that's true. I believe that there are people in that area that know things that could be very important to the case, but for various reasons they haven't talked, or at least if they have talked, it hasn't brought anything to the map that we didn't already know. Uh, it's hard for me to figure out why, uh, because, you know, it's, it's really, you know, the police can protect you. I mean, I can go and talk to these people or I can question people, and, but I, I can't really protect them. I'm just a journalist and the police can really protect these people. So why they haven't talked, you know, I have several theories as to why people haven't talked more, uh, but, you know, it's all pure speculation. I mean, I, I can't really come up and say this is why they haven't talked, but I think there's lots of things there that are still unknown to me and unknown to most people except those who live there. What's really uh, strange for me is seeing every year when it's her anniversary or her birthday, all these people saying, oh, like, because especially with these cases, you can learn a lot by reading comments online. And I'm not talking about Reddit or topics. I'm talking about comments from actual people with their actual names and actual pictures on Facebook or on news comments that they go and they talk about the case. And you can actually learn a lot from reading those comments. And one of the things that stuck out to me was people saying, oh, you know, I've lived there and I've heard these things. And, you know, it's like everyone knows something, but everyone's like, oh, I heard something. And then when you ask them for more, they're like, no, 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 I don't know anything. It's, it's so strange to me. That's very relatable to Maura's case. Do you get the sense that people in the area just want it to go away and they're saying the right thing just to be polite? I get the feeling that this case has haunted that community for over a decade now. And I get the feeling that people want it to be solved, but they don't want to talk. So it's kind of a strange paradox between wanting to move on from that and wanting to actually don't not say anything for, for reasons that are that we don't know necessarily. But what I would say is that a lot of these people... Uh, it's a small town, so when things like that happen, there's no way that everyone doesn't know anything. And the feeling that I got when I was there, when I questioned a, a woman in a convenience store in Richford, is that it's it's there, and it's like it's like a gum that sticks on your shoe. It's there, and you want to get rid of it, but it's there. And those communities can't heal because this case hasn't been solved. So it has been a considerable amount of time. Do you think that someone is ready to talk? Someone who knows something might be ready? The, uh, the limb is getting too heavy and it might snap? It's hard for me to say because I think something major would have to happen for someone to talk. Uh, I've talked. I've said uh, what I know. Uh, obviously, I wasn't there when it happened. And, you know, I wasn't involved from day one. I know certain things and I've talked. And I think that 
it's only time will tell. I think something major needs to happen for people to actually start talking and turning on one another. Uh, obviously, we can't force people to talk. The, fo- the police can force people to talk. And I know firsthand that there are some people that don't talk, but that they know something. I, I know because it, I've come across some people like that and I've seen things online where, you know, someone makes a comment that's so precise and then you ask them for explanations and they just ran, run away. That's happened to me a few times. So to answer your question more in a more specific way, I would have to say that something really, really huge would have to happen, like one of those people getting arrested for for something or them finding out something or... It's hard to say. How do you differentiate between the comments online where you say they're so precise? I don't want you to put your uh, your your journalistic ethics on <laughs> on the line here by you know specifically saying what these comments are that are so uh, precise. Even if I wanted to, I can't really talk about these things because uh, you know some of these people I've spoken to after, and it turns out that they actually really know a lot of stuff. And some of it is very credible. So, I mean, even if you ask me, like, what were they saying? It's not really something that I can say because it would compromise the investigation. Tim, how do you feel about couscous? I don't even know what that is. Couscous. It's like the small rice pasta substance. Uh, It's a food. You can add a lot to it. You can add a lot of seasonings. For example, you can make seared chicken and couscous with broccoli and lemon yogurt sauce. You know where I got that recipe? Um, The burger joint down the street from you? I did not. I don't have a burger joint down the street. I live in a bunker. But I do have three meals delivered to me, perfectly portioned, in a box. You're familiar with Blue Apron, right? Of course I've heard of Blue Apron. I love it. Did you ever think that you'd ever consider cooking spicy shrimp and Korean rice cakes with cabbage and furrow cake? No. Do you even know what furrow cake is? No. I don't either, but it's in my fridge. And I'm going to find out soon. Well, I'm sure it's delicious because I have not been let down by Blue Apron once. Those who spend a lot at restaurants or at high-end grocery chains can now spend under $10 per person for a delicious meal. It's pretty cheap when you break it down like that. If you're going to go out to dinner twice a week or three times a week or even just get a sub from the corner store or even the burger joint down the street from you, you're going to be pushing $10 no matter what. This is cheaper or at least equal to that, but it's so much tastier and it's good for you. And there's no weekly commitment, so you only get deliveries when you want them. Also, what's awesome is the variety. You can choose from a variety of new recipes each week or let Blue Apron's culinary team surprise you. They have like a culinary team. I mean, how fun would it be to be on the uh, the tasting crew? If they're hiring, just putting it out there that that would be a fun job and I would approach it with a lot of gusto. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash missing. You will love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals with Blue Apron, so don't wait. That's blueapron.com slash missing. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. You mentioned that Brianna was assaulted at a party. Can you go into that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Uh, There was a party in uh, Richford, Vermont, which is right at the Canadian border. Like the first time when you cross the border, it's Richford. It's about 1,500 people, 2,000 people. And there was a party there at someone's house. And uh, it was like the end of February. There was like maybe three weeks before Brianna went missing. And she went there, you know, all those drug dealers were there. And, you know, people from like her high school and her at the time ex-boyfriend James was there. And what happened essentially is that the feeling I got, and it was said also in the Disappeared episode, is that Brianna was kind of like a flirtatious person, which is, you know, normal at that age. You know, you're 17, you want attention from the opposite sex. You know, it's it's normal. And she was seen flirting with one of the guys, or talking or flirting. Like, there's two versions of the story. But essentially, she was seen, like, talking and laughing with this guy that was dating this one girl. And uh, she was assaulted by a girl named Keithy Lacrosse and two of her friends. And so she left and she went into her boyfriend, uh, her ex-boyfriend or yeah, her ex-boyfriend's uh, truck. Uh, and then this one girl came out. She said, hey, you know, uh, pull the window down. And, and then she punched her in the face. And uh, that's that's how the assault happened. That's 
at least that's what's being said that was that was said in the disappeared episode that's how the the assault happened she punched her once in the face and gave her a, a concussion i guess she punched her several times because okay. you know yeah the thing is the disappeared show names only one of these girls but my research so, shows that er, there's at least three girls maybe they all assaulted her at once uh, but uh, yeah she did had to go into the hospital and she had a black eye and a concussion and she filed charges against that girl that were later dropped uh, against the family's wishes, uh, they were dropped after she went missing. And the girl was subpoenaed to testify. We've heard things like Brianna was incredibly smart. Uh, she was a big reader. What, what kind of what kind of person in your research, what kind of person was she? Was she a victim of her environment? It, it really irks me to say that because it's it's kind of insulting, but I think she, in in a way, I think she was victim of her age. In the sense that, you know, and then again, you know, we can judge people and, and say things like that. But probably when I was 17, I probably would have been a little naive like she was. Uh, other than that, I would say that, you know, the feeling I got from my research was that she was a really a smart girl. She could do anything she wanted. Uh, she was loved by a lot of people. Uh, a lot of her friends miss her. And she was really the... The typical teenager that you know she was all bubbly and happy you know every picture i see of her she she's she's smiling and she looked really like a, a happy kid really like a happy kid and uh, i really get the feeling that she could have done anything she wanted and i just feel like she was going through a lot when she went missing and it's just it's just so so unfortunate that it happened like that really there's no other way to put it it's just so unfortunate How many people do you think were involved with making Brianna go missing? I would say it depends like what we're talking about. Are we talking about the abduction? Because I believe she was abducted from uh, from the scene where her car was found, abducted forcibly. Mm -hmm. Or are we talking about where she was held? Or are we talking about how she was killed and how they disposed of the body? So I would say uh, between those three or four uh, time frames, I would say that there is at least uh, three to four people that were involved, but there could be as up to 15. Uh, between three and 15 people, yeah. And I don't know all of them. I, I have maybe eight names, four of who have never been made public. Uh, but I did find some things on these people that makes me think the people who told me about them weren't trying to BS me. You know, they weren't trying to, you know, like uh, lead me down the wrong path. I would say that the people who said that definitely knew what they were talking about. Some of the names and, you know, because when, you know, when someone tells you a name and you can find some prior criminal record about that person and when the family knows that person and say, this is who we believe is involved, there's just no way I can just say, oh, well, no, I'm just going to ignore that because it's inconvenient to some people. No, I have to look into that. The amount of people that you mentioned um, horrifies me to begin with when I hear that, that so many people could have been involved. But it also makes me optimistic in that all you need is one of them to talk, right? Right. I, I was just going to say this, like something similar there. It, it's horrifying that up to 15 people. So I'm assuming that two or three or four uh, were part of the abduction. And then there was some sort of taking back to a location where there were other people there. However, it went down, it went down. But up to 15 people, I mean, that is horrifying. And it's, it's like, it's <laughs> to, to be completely 180 on the, um, on 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 looking on the like the positive side of that that one person could could give the fact that up to 15 people haven't said anything in in almost 13 years is incredibly depressing to me that if they and I don't want to say this and sound like you know eternal pessimist here but if 15 people haven't said anything in 13 years what's going to make them talk now things change yeah. Well, what I would do, uh, well, first of all, if I'm the police, I would look into what I gave them. And I know they're doing that, and that can take time. What I would do if I was a police investigator, I would find the weakest member there and just pound on them. Just say, here, I'm giving you a plea deal. This is what I'm giving you, and I'm giving it to you, and I'm telling you that I'm giving it to you, not tricking you and saying, oh, you tell me that, and I'm giving you, and then saying, no, you don't get anything. What I would do is I would just pound on the weakest member and I would say, okay, I'm giving you a plea deal. In exchange, you tell me exactly what you did to that girl. 
And I believe I know who that person that would eventually talk could be. You believe you know who the weakest member of the... the... Yes. Are those people who are potentially involved, are they still all in the area? Some of them are. Uh, some of them aren't. The thing that's really important to know about this case is that there are a lot of out-of-state people that were involved. But there's also, and I suspect there's a couple of locals that helped them out, uh, helped them get away with it. And the reason why it's been going on for so long is part of is because there are some locals that have sworn a secrecy over these things. And, you know, I, I, I'm not going to speculate on that, but it's possible that some locals are like, OK, this happened. We don't ever talk about this until, you know, it's it goes in the grave with us and we don't talk about these things. So I believe that in order to pull off what they pulled off, they've had to have had help from the locals. It's an, It would have been almost impossible. It sounds like everybody who's looking into this case seems to have the same theory as to what happened, which is a little different with Mora's case where people basically group off into three categories. Uh, the opportunistic killer, the running away with somebody, and the um, went into the woods to kill herself. That's basically the three, the three groups that we have. But it sounds like with Brianna's case, it's pretty straightforward. If you're once you start stripping away all of the, uh, all of everything else, once you once you look at the like you said in the beginning, the situation that was happening in the area. Once you kind of realistically look at that. I think that's why people go in that direction, right? Well, to go back to what I said earlier, like one of the main arguments that I have that it wasn't a serial killer in the Brianna Maitland case is is that specific context and what was going on in the air at the time. There's just too much there for me to believe that it wasn't at all related to these people or that it wasn't at all related to, to drugs. And to answer what you said, basically... In the Brianna Maitland case, there's not so much mystery. It's fairly straightforward what could have happened and what was said to have happened and who are some of the people involved. But in Moore Murray's case, there's a lot more mystery. It's like open for speculation. Whereas in Brianna's case, if you don't know the case very well, it's open for speculation. But if you know the case as well as I do and as well as some other journalists do, it's not open for speculation. It's open for a few speculations, like what was the motive or things like that. But it's not... It's fairly straightforward. It's just that they haven't found the proof. They haven't found the what they need because it was really a job. You know, her disappearance slash murder was a job done by a group of professionals. And I don't mean that in a positive way. It really is. It was really done in order to make sure that they left nothing behind. That's what makes this case really, you know, hard to hard to understand and hard to swallow sometimes. Was it an accidental murder? Oh, no, definitely not. No, no, no way. I, I'm just going to say, if it's accidental, someone will have to come forward and prove to me that it's accidental because I have too much stuff that shows it's not accidental at all. No, it was planned. How long was it premeditated? I would say a couple of days before. Maybe I would give it maybe two or three weeks before at the most, but not a month before. Maybe around the time that they kind of felt that she was slowly but surely moving away from them. It was a combination of many events. And actually one of the things that you guys should know and also for your listeners is that, you know, on the day that she went missing, she was shopping with her mother uh, in uh, St. Albans. And while she was in the shop, in the shop, you know, looking at clothes and things, there was someone outside and she went and talked to that person and she came back to her mother and she was uh, agitated. She was shaking. And then her mother said like, Oh, what's going on? And she didn't want to talk about it. She was like, oh, I have to go back to work. I have to get going. I have to get going. So I believe, and I know, I believe I know who that person is. And I believe that person told her, okay, this is what's going to happen to you. And now we really get into speculation. I just really want to be clear on that. I believe that she knew what was going to happen. But I believe that because she was so young and she was in that state of mind, she was like, she brushed it off because she was going to go work and she was going to go and do other stuff. She brushed it off as, oh, there's no way it's that huge. And it turned out that, yes, it was probably that huge. 
And I, that's why I, what I said earlier, and I'm not trying to, you know, insult her or the family or anything. I just really want to make that clear. What I'm saying is that her age played a big part in the sense that if she was older, maybe that teenage na- naivety wouldn't have kicked in so much. Do you believe the, this person or these people have acted again in a similar way? If they have, they haven't in Vermont. I think that this case was so huge and they were so incredibly lucky to get away with it that they probably wouldn't repeat that today. Or if they would, they would do it in a different way. But I don't believe that, I believe that some of these people have killed before. I, I know for a fact that some, pe- some of these people have killed before, but I don't believe that they ever try to repeat that again because they probably knew that with the resources that the Vermont State Police has today that they didn't have back in 2004, they probably wouldn't get away with, away with it again. Do you believe that they think that they are they came so close to the flame with this one that they made the decision that they're not going to do anything like that again? Well, it could be. I mean, I don't know how close that group of people are in everyday life. You know, it's a it's a huge possibility that some of them haven't talked uh, since then. Uh, I, I'm, I can't really say they're even friends with one another, but what I would say is that I believe that some of them have sworn to secrecy with the locals or, or, you know, I could really go a lot further, but what I would say essentially is that I believe they know what they did. I believe they know how severe or, and how serious that is, and they know that there's no way they could pull it off again. So now they're just hoping that this goes the back burner, that just goes away, and I hope it won't. And that's why I'm working on this, because I don't want that to go away. Did you feel any danger when you were looking into this, when you were on location? And do you think there is any danger to people looking into this? I wouldn't say there's any danger. I just think you have to be smart about the way you look into these things. Because even looking at the Mormon case, there's always going to be people that are going to be on the outlook for new people involved in the case. There's always going to be people that are going to really look into, okay, is there someone that's interested in this case? So, and one of the reasons why I've been so subtle and why I'm only coming out now on your podcast for the first time speaking publicly about these things is because I don't necessarily want my name to be associated with this case because looking into this case can be dangerous. I'm not naive and I'm not going to be, oh, well, no, it's it's like looking into, uh, you know, covering an, an election or something. No, this is serious stuff. And I mean, I didn't feel directly in danger, but looking back, there's definitely some things that... I probably would have done differently. But obviously the first time I went there, I was a little apprehensive. And I remember texting my best friend. I was like, hey, you know, I'm spending the day in Vermont. You know, if I don't come back, you know, call the, these people because, you know, I was like, well, you know, something could might happen. And uh, no, but I, I, I can say for sure that I was a little scared when I went there and took pictures of the abandoned barn because, you know, it's a road and people are passing by. So I was like, okay, someone's going to shoot me or something. So I, I definitely was a little scared and, you know, there's certain places, specific places I wouldn't go back, certain people I wouldn't talk to again, but I didn't feel in danger. Nobody threatened me or something, but that's only because, and I'm actually throwing flowers at myself right now, but that, that's only because I'm, I'm really trying to be smart about the way I look into this. I think it's interesting and I don't know if you realize that you've done it, but what you've said about Brianna being 17 years old and you can justify her not taking the situation as seriously as she should have because of her age. I'm not blaming her. No, I, I think it's interesting you saying that and you're applying that same rule to yourself looking into the case. I feel like, and I don't know if you've, you've realized it, but you've, you've taken that naivety that she had and said, I'm not going to do that when I look into this case. Well, no, I, I it's, you know, it's partially true, but I can't really say that uh, I didn't go in there taking thinking I'm not going to be naive. I probably was naive. I probably made some mistakes. I mean, this was the first time that I really looked into a case this deep. But essentially what I would say is that I really wanted to stay uh, out, of the, out of the spotlight because this isn't really about me. This is about finding out what happened to her and, you know, getting justice. But what I would say is that I, wasn't, I, I was a 17-year-old not that long ago. I mean, so obviously it's not like I was a 17-year-old 20 years ago or 15 years ago. 
So I know how I was reasoning at that age, and I know the things I did, and I know the way I, I, I was reacting. So obviously, I tried to transpire that to myself and say, well, let's try and think about how, how I would see things at that age. Because, you know, I mean, when I first started looking at, at the case, this is what really struck me. I'm like, this 17-year-old girl, you know, it, it broke my heart. It still does. Pretty good chat there with Tarek. Would you think, Lance? I think it's some dark stuff. I think uh, I think this case is, has a lot of darkness around it. It is pretty hopeful, though. As dark as it is, it's pretty hopeful. Hearing Tarek speak about the group of people who are the primary suspects gives me hope. Like you, like you had brought up earlier on in the interview it gives me a bit of hope that these the more people that are involved the the more people that have to remain silent so the better chance that someone will crack and we will hear more about this case in one of our next episodes we are going to have on mark harper from mja inc investigations to talk about what he and the rest of mja did to process brianna maitland's car just recently have they come out and said, well, they found DNA. Now, my understanding, I don't know, that I haven't confirmed this yet, but since they have a DNA profile, it's supposed to be entered in CODIS. Well, if it's entered in CODIS, they haven't got a hit. So whoever left this DNA behind has never had a serious crime enough to have his blood taken and entered in CODIS. You'll also hear from Greg Overacker, who is a professional private detective located in upstate New York, who has been with the family nearly since the beginning and has a wealth of information. He also appeared on the Disappeared episode about Brianna, so you might recognize him from that. You might recognize his voice from that. If you look at him superficially, you know, Morris car is found, crashed, abandoned, on the side of the road. She's gone, never to be seen again. Brianna's car. She found crashed, abandoned, never to be seen again. Once you delve into things prior to that, they're much different. 